uh, and the current situation of Russia, we change from Russia to Israel. And we change, we come to the second speaker. We have been starting late, we are a little bit over time, but we are still in time. Um, we are trying to catch up with Helge Eichelmann. So. And after looking deeply into the um, structure of Russian society and the structure of um, Russian polity and why Putin hopefully does not represent nor reflect uh, the whole Russia, I have um, the chance to present to you Helge Eichelmann, who is a PhD candidate at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz and who is uh, in his research interested, oriented, um, uh, focused on uh, the dynamics of coalition negotiations in multi-party democratic systems. So he's uh, observing the case of Israel, perhaps doing also some studies in German coalition negotiations. I don't know, but we have uh, sort of weird coalitions now in these days. If you observe the last Landtagswahlen in Germany, we do anything that goes in Germany now. Uh, so it's pretty interesting what this could uh, come. Uh, he also has not only an academic focus, but he uh, is the head of the German office of the Israeli German Chamber of Commerce. So he, he's also into sort of real politics, uh, real economic politics or real trade politics between Israel and Germany. So Mr. Eichelmann, the floor is yours. And he will talk to us about the dynamics of coalition negotiations in the Israeli party democracy. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, well, it's, it's interesting to have a, a different audience. Normally, uh, I do these uh, system analyses for, for German delegations, so it will be very interesting to talk about Israeli democracy to Israelis. I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, obviously, the, the Israeli party democracy is a, is a diverse and volatile system, but um, we can only observe that recently. I mean, we, we heard from, from Leipart uh, yesterday in uh, Democracy and Plural Societies, he just suggested to classify Israel as a semi-constitutional democracy, stressing the, I quote, highly egalitarian nature of Israeli society, unquote, which is something we wouldn't probably agree today. Um, that was 1977, and obviously that has changed. And since prime ministers always have to form a sustainable consensus uh, before starting negotiations on reforms, a divided coalition or volatile parliament uh, certainly matters when it comes to selling negotiation results to the internal level, whether it be the coalition majority or the general public. Um, special interests and clientele parties can be identified within the Israeli society along four social cleavages today. There is the religious versus secular um, position towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, and more recently, uh, social stratification. <laughs> the Israeli democracy has faced strong public demand in all four areas to be addressed politically. And if we understand that these social cleavages have a strong impact on voting behavior, uh, the self-understanding of Israeli parties representing social groups and classes become very important in the outcome of democratic performance. So basically, um, what understanding coalition negotiations can help us understand is the performance of political outcome, especially when it comes to political reform. Uh, regarding the need of reform in any of these four cleavages, the process of decision making within the parties themselves and following within the coalition governments can give crucial insight to understand when reform policies can be implemented successfully and where they fail. Um, over the last 20 years, all governments have addressed the respective problems by proposing a nonpartisan constitutional reform, which is still, uh, we, we're, we're still waiting for this probably a little longer to come. And in the respected areas, even a conclusive constitutional reform might be, might be in need. It might be argued that overall political reform involving a broad general consensus across all political boundaries would be blocked by clientele interests. Thus, the ability to pursue political reform agendas, even if preferable by the party and electorate, relies on the possibilities in the coalition negotiating arena. The systemic uh, settings are as much important as the negotiator's position and preferences. Um, I'd like to address the following questions 
in understanding negotiations. One, which tools are used to form coalitions, which are more and which ones are more useful than others. Second, is the possible set of outcomes determined by external factors, like voting behavior, for example, or can the course of negotiations change the leeway for political reform? And third, how important are the negotiators' abilities to assure both internal and external support in negotiations? Now, DuPont considers coalitions, and this is another quote, to constitute deliberately constructed networks who may have different interests and policy priorities, yet sharing common objectives, unquote. The task of building both friendly and pragmatic coalitions to form a majority government places negotiator in an essential role. Um, the approach of understanding systematic dynamics via negotiating processes is mostly the result of new liberal theory designs in the field of international relations. Foremost, the principle of two-level negotiations introduced by Putnam in 1988 is oriented at the interdependent character of decision-making. The actual level of negotiating official decisions thus is, def um, is defined not only by the dynamics of both partners exchanging ideas, the intrasystematic negotiations within the system itself matters just as much, since this level provides the negotiator with a, a win set or a setting of preferences he can, he can actually achieve. Um, if given a small win set due to restrictions on the first level, the chance of reaching a compromise on the other level might be slim, and vice versa. Therefore, the negotiator needs to widen his freedom of way on both levels simultaneously, making, it, making him basically a poker player on, on two simultaneous uh, tables. Um, on one hand, the distribution of information is vital to the negotiator to assess all possible outcomes and preferences, um, and the lack of or misinterpretation of new information can lead to false assessments and disadvantages towards the negotiating opponent. On the other hand, the negotiator himself can distribute information about his preferences or even mislead in order to gain leeway. The negotiator becomes a strategic actor who is determined to secure his inner and outer autonomy in order to lead negotiations in, or in accordance with his own preferences. Now, multi-party systems and volatile voter support make for a high degree of uncertainty uh, in the bargaining process. Following the two-level approach, negotiators need to appease on two levels. One is forming an, a dependable and stable coalition with another party on the one hand, while pleasing voters and parties' interests and needs um, on the other. Therefore, individual preferences of the negotiator can't be sufficient to tell the whole story. Um, coalition negotiators reflect a conflict between coming to power and Im implementing policies on a vital topic within voters' interests. In other words, while winning a seat in the cabinet or even becoming head of government is always an essential success of negotiations, the bargaining process will often include <coughs> trade-offs on political topics or other uh, compromises, such as uh, portfolios, positions, and ministries. The negotiation process is volatile and risky, since negotiators cannot predict voter support for the long run, especially. Uh, in Israel. However, future coalition partners need to predict how coalition settings and the topics the government is going to pursue will affect the support within their bases. Um, party negotiators are crucial decision makers in the political process of multi-party democracies such as Israel. The possible pool of coalition partners and the sum of win sets available to the negotiator shape the contents of coalition negotiations. Therefore, the amount of leeway for the leading party given by its voters and members is just as important to the success of negotiations as the position of the smaller party as a possible veto player. The more the small party is needed to form a stable government, the more the negotiator of the leading party should be interested in trading off, even to the brink of foul compromise against the voters' interest. Um, the hypotheses Putnam derived from this two-level approach give an overview of our possible outcomes of negotiations. If negotiating partners can offer large win sets, the chances of a positive outcome resulting in a cooperation agreement are fairly high. If the win sets turn out to be small, the picture differs. 
Putnam argues that only negotiators with a fairly large windset can credibly assert an interest in cooperation. On the other side, a small windset could lead to the assumption that the other's leeway isn't substantial enough to guarantee the necessary compromises, thus stepping away from a negotiated agreement. Large windsets increase the likelihood of overlapping preferences on both sides. However, smaller windsets can also be preferable. The distribution of possible gains of cooperation favor the negotiating partner who can credibly declare that his hands are tied. In effect, internal weakness can be converted into external strength on the negotiating table. The personal preferences of the negotiators in this um, setting become essential in a complete analysis. The position of the negotiator towards both his own background internally and towards the opponent on the other side can be both hindering as well as boosting cooperating inter interests. Interestingly, um, the later contributions to this approach use terms that are familiar <laughs> with, with observing Israeli politics. Um, depending on the position of one's own preferences towards the windsets of both sides, negotiators can act as falcons and doves. A dove would be closer to the preferences of the opponent than his internal setting, thus being more inclined to cooperating uh, than internal actors. There's one example where Prime Minister Rabin and Yasser Arafat as a setting were described as a setting of doves where both sides preferred a positive negotiating outcome rather than the status quo making more way from their respective windsets towards the other. In comparison to falcons, whose preferences are even further away from the other side than their own windset, doves can profit from their position in negotiations. By stating that their windset leaves them with tied hands, doves can try to increase their distribution gains in a possible agreement. Inverting the process, uh, negotiators can use their position on the external level to change their windsets on the internal level. This makes Putnam's approach highly dynamic and open for a variety of factors that contribute to the positions of negotiators. Now, negotiating power and influence over windsets depends on the degree of information that the negotiator has available. A false or incomplete analysis of the other's internal constraints or preferences can lead to improbable demands or extreme positions that result in the failure of negotiations, and I will um, have an example later on. In respect to his internal windset, the negotiator can use his position on the external negotiating table as an information gatekeeper to push for cooperation. If information is scarce, the negotiator can use his information advantage in order to leave internal ratification processes only with two options, taking the agreement or status quo. In addition, um, the cases, case analyses show that negotiators will try to influence ratification processes in their favor, even building elite systems where the information is only distributed to trusted internal partners, partners thus keeping the initiative and increasing their negotiating power. One example, for example, is, uh, is uh, the European Union and the European Council, where ratification processes internally in the own state are manipulated, if you will, to gain more negotiating power uh, on the international level. The result is a structural democracy deficit that is typical for this process and is even more interesting when referred to coalition negotiations in democratic systems. In return, negotiators will pre prefer agreements on the external level that increase their internal autonomy. The negotiator in between both windsets can be the reshaping um, agent to systematically change negotiating tables in favor. Um, in coalition negotiations, perceptions always remain tricky. The, perceptions, uh, the perspective of future elections overshadows historic views of coalition partners, especially when traditional voting patterns fade and volatile voting behavior increases. The result is an increase in possible options and strategies, but making information distribution even more vital to produce successful outcomes. The outcome of the negotiating process um, leads to the performance outcome of the government coalition in office. The outlines of an agreement basically evolve around two questions that need to be addressed. One is who gets in, very simple, and the other who gets what, meaning the distribution of portfolios. 
The outcome is unstable when and if one or more coalition partners are likely to defect, even until the point where the coalition cannot guarantee a stable majority and early elections become inevitable. Um, a great deal of analysis regarding the case of the Israeli democrat democrat democratic system have focused on interests and motives the parties seek to represent by voters' mandate. In his election analysis of 2013, Levine allocates the gains and losses of party blocks according to their common ideological denominator, for example, religious, nationalist, secular, or even nationalist orthodox. Another example is the analysis of system change and the effect on the bargaining power of clientele parties and interest groups. For example, the two bellow system Israel introduced from 1993 to 1999 greatly affected voters' party preferences <coughs> and bargaining power of smaller parties. Um, the assessment of sorting Israeli party parties according to social interest preferences or blocks has been done convincingly over the years and is regarded as an essential backdrop when, an, when analyzing analyzing external or internal changes to the democratic system. Three aspects uh, in order to enhance the picture of multi-party coalitions in Israel. One is the assessment of wind sets and personal preferences during negotiations and the possible changes throughout the process. Second, the strategies of ne negotiators to influence their, these negotiations. And third, the perception or misperception of information regarding internal external preferences. Um, maybe we should skip to the two examples I would like to provide. Um, the case of 2008 and 2009 is particularly interesting because we, have, we had a case where the external setting of voting behavior, party preferences, and uh, the um, and foreign policy preferences were fairly comparable, but we had one case where coalition negotiations failed, uh, the case of Tsipi Livni in 2008, and then early elections and the success of coalition negotiations with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, in 2008, the party of Prime Minister Ehud Olmert had lost of the most of the momentum that led her into the office in the 2006 elections. Despite of the loss of an identification figure, Sharon, for, um, for health reasons, Kadima and Olmert had come out of the election with 29 seats, even 17 ahead of Likud. However, two years in the process, the main objective of the government had run into a stall. With the peace process, process derailed, opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu had made up much leeway in, opin in opinion polls. So with the resignation of pri the prime minister uh, and the following accusations of um, corruption, this accelerated the process of evening up the odds, basically, uh, leaving both parties with the same situation. Um, following the resignation, Tsipi Livni, as his designated successor, had run a decisive platform to push for renewed and earnest talks with the Palestinian delegation. Although public opinion support for a conclusive accord resulting in a two-state solution remained stable and strong, frustration with lack of process had also led to disappointing approval rates for the Israeli government. In effect, Livni's preferences made her a friendly candidate for possible coalition partners from the center-left and left parties, especially Labour. However, unstable support from her own party regarding her main political goal, the setup of uh, peace talks, made her position vis-a-vis -vis her negotiating windset a mixed blessing. On one hand, her preferences towards Ehud Barak, head of the Labour Party, made her essentially a ne negotiating dove with the ability to claim a tight hand strategy. On the other hand, with growing nationalist tendencies on the other side of the aisle, as well as within her own party, too many concessions to the left would leave her weak internally while negotiating with religious or right-wing parties in a hawkish position. Barak therefore entered the coalition negotiations with more bargaining power than the sheer numbers indicated. With Labour's 19 seat, seats quintessential to forming a stable government, Barak positioned himself more to the centre, even meeting with Netanyahu of Likud prior to the meeting with Livni. In the end, a joint agreement was reached, giving Livni 48 um, seats, lacking 13 seats for, for the majority. But by then, com comments out of other parties' commissions already indicated that Livni had lost substantial bargaining power while conceding to her only peer partner. 
With 13 additional seats needed for a stable majority, the lack of alternatives narrowed Livni's windset further. Three right-wing parties had to be left aside in order to pursue the goal of peace negotiations with the Palestinians, taking 30, 32 seats out of the equation. A left-leaning minority government relying on the support of the Arab parties had placed Livni's accepted um, personal preferences even further from the Kadima windset, eventually making her dovish position a liability in securing internal support. Therefore, Livni both turned to orthodox and left-wing parties, with Shas and its 12 seats being the most promising coalition partner. The negotiation window of opportunity wasn't considerably large, with public opinion polls indicating a shift towards the center-right and a limited mandate from Livni's own party. This left Livni with two options, extending her own negotiating windsets both internally and in comparison uh, com uh, cooperation with other parties, or making her preferences more receptible for the public in the outlook of new elections. Livni chose negotiations, but eventually failed to gain the support of Shas and the position of the Sephardi Orthodox Party as a gatekeeper between Kadima and Likud sub substantially strengthened its bargaining power and opened up negotiations on both sides. She was able to maximize their demands without the need of conceding to one side, as other options remained un uh, unexploited. A last attempt to gain 13 seats into the coalition failed, and Livni's windset wasn't able to produce convincing part bargaining chips especially in regard of her own preferences only partially shared by her own party. On October 23, 2008, Livni declared that the bargaining process had come to an end and a substantial trade-off had been offered to Shas with her supposed um, to receive funding and subsidies for child allowances and religious education. The turning point was reached with the religious parties expecting to have an even stronger position after new elections. Now, in the second case, of the 2009 Knesset elections, um, it constitutes a reset in public opinion preferences. Um, as Caspi observes in regard of the competing campaigns, quote, the elections have lost their function, especially in regard to offering policy alternatives, unquote. As both Kadima and Likud avoided any irreversible position towards renewing peace talks with the Palestinians, let alone providing concrete foreign policy outlines the elections left both Netanyahu and Livni with several options to produce a tangible multi-party coalition. On February 20th, following recommendations of the majority of party leaders, President Shimon Peres bestowed Benjamin Netanyahu with the task of forming a government, despite the fact that Likud lacked one seat in comparison to Kadima. Netanyahu publicly favored a coalition of national unity with the three centrist parties, Likud, Kadima, and Labour, united to keep a moderate agenda. The Likud leader had a significant windset or um, preference advantage towards Livni, as an alternative right wing religious coalition would also produce a majority while Livni had run out of options. Thus, he pu pushed for a strong Likud position with him as prime minister and no sharing of power, as it had been in the case of the 1980s unity government. <coughs> Livni and Kadima turned down the offer and went into a position, leaving the second uh, option open for exploration. The Likud party had run into the struggle uh, to the election campaign with no distinctive agenda or policy to pursue, mostly due to the internal struggle the party was going through. The consequence was a considerably large win set for the designated Prime Minister Netanyahu to trade off with other coalition partners regarding policy position. However, with a great risk of uncertainty regarding future preferences of the Likud base. The challenging task was to coordinate the other party's interests in a way that everyone would gain in a government with no distinctive political direction. Uh, the first partner to join proved to be Lieberman and Yisrael Beitenu, who brought 15 seats to the table. Choosing him as foreign minister brought about diplomatic strains with US and European partners, but gave Netanyahu both the opportunity to appeal to his own right-leaning Likud factions and checking Lieberman to make concessions towards religious parties. And now 42 street strong, uh, seat strong coalition resembled the situation of Livni's Kadima in 2008, but with a substantial difference. Netanyahu's own preferences didn't diverge from potential partners. 
On the contrary, the negotiation leader had consistently avoided making any promises or drawing red lines that would have shrunk his leeway in the process. Nonetheless, since no consistent political bloc was able to produce a minority, a majority, trade-offs between secularist and orthodox, as well as nationalist and centrist parties, had to be made. The coalition partners Netanyahu brought in had no common denominator regarding any pre pressing political agenda. However, the designated prime minister was able to offer substantial advantages to join the government than staying out of it. The first runner-up was Shas, who was compensated with key portfolios to protect, uh, protect autonomy regarding religious affairs and education, as well as an increase in subsidies for religious schools, child allowances, and so on. The designated ministers also received additional budget increases. The perspective of the most right-leaning religious government in uh, Israel's history left the head of labor, Ehud Barak, under pressure. Netanyahu could now sell an otherwise unacceptable coalition with right-wing and orthodox parties to labor as a means to be the centrist counterpart. Barak was given the defense ministry and a substantial say on every security matter, which convinced him even to risk a breach within his own party. Being in was preferable to being out, especially since Kadima's Livni had already assumed the role of opposition leader, <coughs> leaving labor at the risk of falling into insignificance. Now let me conclude. Uh, both cases anal uh, analyzed have shown that the two-level game approach adds a revealing perspective to the understanding of coalition negotiations and the shifts between, uh, within the democratic system in general. While the growing bargaining power of clientele parties and the increasing volatility in voters' behavior have been analyzed, the position of negotiating leaders in this environment mustn't be underestimated. In the situation of 2008 and 9, the ability or lack thereof to subordinate one's own preferences in order to remain in a dovish position proved to be one advantage Netanyahu was able to use in comparison to his predecessor. Livni's position, disputed by her own party, just as Netanyahu's in 2009, turned hawkish in negotiations with the um, Shas party, unwilling to compromise on her foreign policy preferences. The reliance on trade-offs and the inability to, perform, to form stable alliances across a certain political agenda leaves the political system in Israel with a problem. Overall political reform is not only a difficult task to achieve, but even isn't a political goal to be rewarded in a coalition negotiation. The two cases have shown that pushing for political agendas leaves the risk of being turned down by clientele parties. In this environment, the tight hand strategy can result in the negotiation opposite turning towards another more promising candidate. And the latter's ability to substitute all agendas before the perspective of forming a government left him in a stronger position and the costs of coalition bargaining were spread across the board. The perception of windsets in comparison to one's own agenda can determine weal and woe of coalition building bargaining, and the type of trade-offs and compromises shed revealing light on the stability of a government. In the Israeli case, the bargaining analysis suggests that the short living and the inability to perform promised reforms of recent governments can be traced to the systemic environment where certain strategies in coalition negotiations may prove to be more successful but will not produce stable majorities to pursue any substantial political agenda, let alone overall constitutional reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this leaves us with a not so optimistic view on <laughs> the Israeli capacity to form coalition which can enable change or offer um, policy options or choices. Um, I open the floor to your questions. Might be interesting for Israeli to listen to German analysis of what <laughs> German research candidates think about your capacity to um, yeah, do convincing coalitions which govern you well. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it is a very convincing analysis of why we are so frustrated in this country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, uh, as you know, proportional electoral system is the most radical form of democratic election. 
so that it proves the relationship, the, observe, the converse relationship between democratization, over-democratization, and governability. So basically, you can say that democracy is not a system that is supposed to ensure governability. It is a system that is supposed to ensure legitimacy. So the gap between legitimation and governability is a major problem in most democracies. Because um, of that uh, condition, uh, one can ask the question whether the price of legitimacy or the reduction of legitimacy and the gain of governability is something that publics can agree with. Are they willing to um, get away with a government that doesn't deliver the goods, that maintains more or less an unhappy, more or less uh, stable system that is sometimes doing something, basically the left hand cancels what the right hand does. For example, we have, as you know, um, a legislative governmental committee. I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't want too much sort of stories. Okay, so I will give I only that example. Yeah, okay, <laughs> uh, we have a government, uh, well, if I would have seen five Israeli politicians, uh, political scientists responding, I would have cut it, but I, I was the only one. <laughs> Well, but we are but never mind, over, I, over I'm, I'm, anyway. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not ruling out the possibility that some of my colleagues will, uh, will respond here. But the point is this, we have a committee of government that decides on bills for the legislation that the government will approve. So what happens is that they approve many bills which the ministers want to promote, and then the prime minister cancels that. Not only the prime minister, they never go down to the parliament. So you have here a situation where the system is a system based on checks and balances over the possibility of legislation. Okay. No, I think, uh, I mean, to your credit, but I guess Israel is not the only country which has a problem between the, say, democracy efficiency <laughs> paradigm, uh, because, uh, you know, I know many German industrials who are really uh, keen to go to China to get an airport done in three months and not in basically five years because there's no citizen protest. So, <laughs> no, 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 I just wanted to be a little bit sort of funny this morning. Um, are there other questions or contributions? Um, I take two, then final round. Here <laughs> and here. The microphone is, is in front. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let me bring up a, a subject that both of you, with German background, that uh, a country that has seen a Green Party, and it's not even shocked to have Green Party uh, go getting into coalition with right or with left. Now, uh, have you looked into the uh, situation in Israel? <laughs> there was a, an effort that didn't come from politicians to have a Green Party. Eventually, what happened is that a professor from a university jumped into the fray. He brought in a rabbi with a million dollars from Denmark and the elections that brought to power Netanyahu, actually, in those elections, it was the breaking up of the Greens into three different parties that none of them was able to go in over the minimum required in order to enter the parliament. Now, an anal analysis of this and <coughs> the economic interests that supported Netanyahu could in effect explain why this happened. Did you ever analyze this? Okay, last question. Uh, well, I'm not an Israeli citizen, but I've been living here for 45 years, so I have some 
Uh, I would make two or three short remarks. First short, of all, please, it might we're be already over time. <coughs> Pardon? short, please, because we are already over time. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the, the, the country with the most similar uh, constitution is the Netherlands. I think this, it's worth making uh, comparisons between Israel and the Netherlands in, in these matters. Uh, secondly, uh, one has to understand that there are basically three kinds of parties in Israel, and this has, has an impact on such negotiations. First of all, there are genuine parties in the European sense. That is, they have enrolled memberships, they have offices in, all, all over the country, uh, principally the Labour Party and the Likud, and this is why these two parties uh, continue to be represented uh, constantly in the Knesset, because they have a, a kind of an inf infrastructure which is permanently existing. Uh, the second kind of party is the one that represents some ethnic or religious group, such as the religious parties or the, the Arab parties and so on. Uh, they don't necessarily have a, such a full uh, structure, but they do have, again, a basic uh, continual uh, core of support which, which uh, exists from one, one election to another. Uh, the third kind of party is actually nothing more than an electoral list. Uh, and most of the center, centrist parties in Israel, in fact all of them in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, have really been lists uh, <coughs> compiled by some charismatic leader uh, who brings in a number of friends, whether it's Raphael Etan or Eric, Eric Sharon or Tzipi Livni or, or um, now Cahalon and Lapid and so on. Uh, these parties are very vulnerable because uh, they hang really upon the, uh, the charisma of the leader uh, and uh, they tend not to survive if they don't manage to get into government. Once they're out of government, people don't hear about them anymore. Uh, and this is the problem with Kadima. It, it, never, it, it attempted to set up a proper uh, party structure but never did. Uh, and so it... it, 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 it uh, and I think when you look at these negotiations, you have to take this into consideration that these uh, personal list parties uh, in the negotiations, they basically know they're only going to survive if they stay in, if, if they get into government. Okay, so. Okay, brief. I, brief I'll, tr I'll try briefly. First, uh, Professor Israel. Well, um, I would say that if we talk about proportionate elections, um, the idea of multi-party democracies was to address social cleavages, social conflict through democratic processes, which is something that happened fine. You didn't have civil war in Israel among religious or secular strangers or anything else. The side effect was that the system can, can be exploited to prevent political reform. And this is something that is an un unintended consequence of this very, very open, open democratic system. And the, the consequence is that, you know, the constitutional reform to, to change the system, to make this flaw, or to, to make this flaw go away, lies in the hands of those who can, who, who can work as a gatekeeper. So um, this is basically the point that through the, election, through the electoral system, you cannot really expect a constitutional reform to, to alleviate the system, this, this flaw. Now, for the Green Party, I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's difficult to address. Um, most literature indicates that the Green Party was unsuccessful in Israel because it doesn't address any of the social cleavages I, I strained before. And this is true for most parties that emerge or, or emerged over the last 30, 40 years in Israel. There were new coming parties, like the Pensionist parties for, Party, for example, who strained a, so, a certain social aspect that was addressed by, by, a, by, by a part of the society. And it, ha it was successful for a certain period of time, and then it, in, it, uh, it came back. But I would say that the problem with the Green Party in Israel is that it is always subordinated under the conflict between the, uh, of, of these four social cleavages. So I wouldn't expect any, any Green movement to, to have political importance in the, in, over the next future. Uh, well, comparing to the Netherlands, that would probably uh, be, be much, much too long to, to discuss now. But um, what, we can, what we can see when we, when we try to classify parties in the Israeli party system, that the, 
the traditional way of addressing political conflict through a party organization, like you mentioned Labour and Likud, um, isn't relevant in the political process anymore. Because when we look at coalition negotiations, especially when we look at Likud, it isn't a, um, it isn't a conversation between Likud members and the elite. It's just done by the elite. And this is what I mentioned with reforming the ratification process. The ratification process as with both Labour and Likud have been reshaped to gain more political power in coalition negotiations. And this will continue for, for one simple reason, because the, the life circle of small interest parties or, or party clientele interest parties will be much faster than before. And this is something that where 2008, I believe, is a watershed, because this, since 2008, the life circle of political movements has become so fast that you cannot, you cannot rely on any prior elections to determine which coalition partner will fit best. You can see this with, with many, many several movements. Lapid is one, one example. And I believe that um, the internal struggle of parties to perform a political consensus as it was intended in, in an original system, will not happen anymore because it's, it's, it's basically a negotiating, a pre-negotiating process done by the elite, exactly to do what you said, to, to gain trade-offs or portfolios. So it's, it makes for much more volatile and, un, and, and risky environment, which predicts even more early elections and, and falling governments but it will not be addressed internally by the parties themselves. So we learned a lot and we looked deeply into the soul of Russia and the policy system of Israel. Um, we convey for 